Hello and welcome to this podcast. Now, I'm sure you probably used to listening to my podcasts by now. And uh, what I do is, from time to time, I just select something from my library, a pre-recorded podcast or whatever from my library, because I record these things as very odd times. Just depends on when I feel inspired. So I just take it out and then I add a beginning to it, you know, and then I, I post it. So if you have natal placements or you have significant aspects that you'd like to know more of on an individual level like that, you know, you can send me an email or send me a WhatsApp requesting, um, you know, deeper insight into it. I mean, it's not going to be a reading for sure, but at least... You get a podcast like this if, you know, if eventually I have something in my library already done, uh, matching your request. It's very rarely that I actually have the time to record new ones. I record these sporadically and, you know, without rhyme or reason or schedule, basically. It just depends on whenever I feel like. And so, uh, today I'm going to be talking about Venus's placement in Sagittarius. Venus in Sagittarius is one of those natal placements that you just look at and you're like, okay, what is this supposed to mean? What's going on here? Because when you look at what Venus really stands for and then you look at Sagittarius, it doesn't really fly out at you what it truly means. And this is one of the things about the nature of Sagittarius. Sagittarius looks like that, you know, that member that shouldn't be there in a sense. You know, it's kind of strange why it's there. But within the context of the explanation, you will understand the essential need for the Sagittarian archetype. It is of such tremendous importance, and without it, then life literally becomes unbearable. The mind cannot cope without the Sagittarian archetype. And the same can be said for any of of the other 11 archetypes, but, you know. So, Venus... What is Venus? And Venus is something I've delved into in my other podcasts on the Venusian placements. But I'm not going to be as detailed as in the others. But concisely, it is important to remember that Venus is a vector. And a vector is a measurement that has both magnitude and direction. Unlike a scalar, which is just a simple magnitude of measurement. For instance, the temperature, when you take the temperature at any point in a room, it's a scalar because with only one number, you can tell what is going on at that point. But vectors are quite different and vectors require a notion of directionality in order to understand what the measurement really means. A typical example is acceleration. It's a vector, okay, because you're accelerating in a given direction. It is only by specifying the direction that the acceleration itself makes sense. Otherwise, nobody knows what you're talking about. Okay? Now, Venus is like that. It's a notion of direction. It's a vector. And it is usually, it's one of the first stages really of what it means to be self-aware in terms of sentience. Because when a self comes into being, it doesn't know what it is per se. Because it's having an experience it has never had before. And so there's nothing to really latch onto, to reflect, to say, okay, this is what it feels like to be a self. And so the process really starts off as one of discovery. Now, the way that this happens in human beings is that the infant child becomes aware increasingly of its body. Prior to this awareness, it doesn't know that it has a body. You see, it doesn't perceive itself as a self. It just knows that it is. Now, this sense of self as a body begins to occur as the child begins to suckle from its mother. So that we can see that the sense of self really as a body, a physical body, starts from the sense organ of taste. It's not a coincidence. That's exactly how our cognition is wired. It starts from what you put in your mouth. And it is from what you put in your mouth that you begin to calibrate and measure. And your brain, what it does, it it begins to tune itself to match 
the signals that it receives from those taste organs. Your tongue, your mouth. And it begins to prune the network of connections of neurons in its head and to realign them to match the sense of taste so that what you really call a perception of your body revolves around the sense of taste. Most people don't know this. Okay? So, it is very important, you know, to try to look at the expression of your little baby as they learn to suckle. Because what they're doing at that point in time is they are becoming aware of the fact that they have a body. Now, this takes time. It takes about six months, really. For the child to come to the conclusion that the hand that moves in front of its eyes is its body. Its own hand. You know? Prior to that, the child actually thinks that, you know, it, you know, it's literally just an awareness or a presence, but it doesn't have a physical realization of that presence. That's really what it is. So Venus actually starts as a sensing requirement. And like I've said, this sensing requirement is calibrated by the sense of taste. And then all the other sense organs begin to relay information. But all the relayed information, they revolve around that sense of taste because it is the most powerful at that point. Now, ultimately, when the individual grows up, the sense of vision takes over and becomes the primary coordinating mechanism for all the other senses. But prior to that, it is the sense of taste in the unconscious state or semi-unconscious state that the little infant child is in all right and this sense of taste now becomes a notional vector pointing to how the child senses what is good for them so when something is sweet the child is encouraged and when something is bitter they want to get away from it and this simple dichotomous decision making process that is a binary decision making process is it good for me do i like it or do i not like it that forms the basis upon which the entire venusian system is constructed so that what venus really signifies is a sense of pleasure it's an instinct that is a vector that points us towards that which we truly desire that which we find to be pleasurable harmonious and ultimately beautiful because the perception of beauty engages all the senses and it starts with a sense of taste but ultimately it transforms into uh, major coordination by the sense of vision so that by the time we're you know even young adults and maybe older we tend to perceive beauty through vision than through taste but our first sense of beauty was taste that's really what it is it was taste that allowed us to understand what the world really is all about and what you know our sense of value really is now when the sensing organism itself or the sensing process itself is a calibration it's looking for a particular reference and the idea for the venusian system is that once this reference is found anchors are sunk and once the anchors are sunk the sense of having or being a physical body is finalized and once that happens the individual does not move anymore so what we like and what we don't like these are things that are formed very early in life now it takes us a long time to be able to articulate or to properly understand what these early formations are and so we spend a lot of time what i consider to be a lot of useless time trying to figure out something that we already knew right from when we were very little it's just that when life comes in and all the other senses come in, we become confused. We forget. And we begin to rediscover the sense of value over and over and over again. And we make mistakes because sometimes we choose things that are not good for us. Because the Venusian system has now been overridden by lots of other systems, especially the conscious mind as it is developing. And so we make mistakes, and each time we make a mistake that affects our sense of self-value, ultimately, when the consequences arrive, they force us to re-examine the decisions that we have made, especially the decisions regarding our self-value. And that reintroduces us back to our Venusian system, which is just a construct within us, which was formed very early in our lives. Now, the idea of someone who needs to be successful and prosperous is that you need to keep an eye on your value system because your value system is how you value yourself and what you value in the world is tied to how you value yourself. And so the value system, when it is working properly, 
when you have learned how to get back in touch with it, then it means that you understand the things that you must say no to because they simply don't match with what you consider to be valuable for yourself. Now, the interesting thing about being able to value yourself in this way is that you can also value things in the world and then you can know how to value others. And then you, you can also respect what others value. We know that naturally we are drawn to beautiful things. We're drawn to things that have a certain amount of uh, proportion and symmetry in them. It's not a coincidence. We're drawn to these things throughout all our sense organs. You know, it doesn't matter if it's if it's the ears, we, ex we appreciate the kind of music or the tonal nature of music and the harmony of the frequencies that form music. These things are all senses of beauty and proportion. We see people with very pleasant faces and we ask ourselves, what is it that actually makes a face pleasant? It's the notion of symmetry and proportion. That's what we see. Everything seems to be in the right place. And when it all combines together, what comes out to us is a perception of finesse, symmetry, beauty, harmony. And it's literally a type of distribution because everything is where you expect it to be. And when it comes at you like that, you perceive it as beautiful. All the faces that we find pleasing to ourselves, you know, even the cosmetic industries are keenly interested in this sense of what beauty is because their entire business model depends on it. Being able to perceive the harmony of things, being able to understand how like things connect together or the affinity that like-minded things have for themselves. These are all notions of beauty that exist deep within the psyche. Now, when the Venusian placement is disturbed or when it's undergoing some change, maybe at, during an interim period, then this sense of beauty is thrown into disarray. Imagine where we have to choose between two jobs or three jobs and we're trying to figure out and decide which one is going to be best for us. The difficulty we are having is because our Venusian instinct cannot properly assess which one of these opportunities represents the best opportunity for us. And the only reason why that is happening is because we've not been able to frame those opportunities within a proper Venusian context. We're still looking at it in all, in all, all other ways. Because at the end of the day, you simply need to boil everything down to, does it taste good to eat or does it taste bad to eat? That's really what it is. That's what the notion is. It's just a simple vector that points in either one direction or the other. And every human being is almost guaranteed to move away from that which brings them displeasure. People make mistakes because they don't know exactly what displeasure is or what it represents or what pleasure is and how it is represented. So we make choices, you know, we guess in such situations and we invariably make mistakes. Now, but as we make mistakes, it allows us to properly assess what we consider to be valuable. And so because of that, everybody's Venusian placement tells them the way in which they appreciate beauty. And this also translates into the way they prefer to be loved. Because when you are face to face with beauty, it does something to you. It moves you. You feel a very strong affinity with what you find beautiful. That's really what it is. It's a strategy women have known for a very long time. That if you want to attract something, it needs to be pleasing. It needs to be visually pleasing, audibly pleasing, etc., etc. All right? And then you stand a better chance of attraction and connection. That's really what it is. But the same also goes for people. You know, s people contain certain types of behaviors which we don't know when we meet them. We have no idea because we cannot look into their heads. But when they begin to display the different types of behaviors, our Venusian instinct is also responsible for telling us which of these behaviors that are pleasing to us and which we find to be rather offensive. That's what it means to be attracted to someone. And that's the liberal instinct. That's what you find in Libra. This assessment of what is pleasing and beautiful to us. But this time around, it is a much higher perception than just the sense of taste. That is, except you're kissing them and you like the taste of their lips. But more often than not, it just turns out to be your assessment of their varying faces. The number of faces that an individual can put out. Each face is a behavioral type within the personality because a personality is a myriad of behavioral responses. It is those behavioral responses as a set 
That's what makes up a personality. And so when I talk about Sagittarius, for instance, there are a ton of behavioral archetypes within Sagittarius itself. So when I talk about Venus in Sagittarius, I am selecting for those behavioral patterns that correspond to what Venus stands for. I'm willing to discard all the rest, even though they're all in Sagittarius. So that you find that each sign is capable of reproducing all the functional lights or planets, as you you prefer to call them. Okay? So when you find a planet or a functional light in a sign, it means that the sign has to reproduce the effects of that planet as best as it can at that degree where it is located. That is the sign's way of contributing to the interaction or the interactive process that is your natal chart that now gives rise to the full complexity of your personality. That's really what it is. And so when we do natal chart synthesis, all we are doing is looking at this complex interactivity pattern, right? And delineating what the underlying singular meaning really is. And when you have that, you have an important part of who you are because everywhere you are going to go, everything you are going to become is coming from that central story of yours that you now have. And the Venusian aspect is one of the key requirements for completing this story. All the functional lights come together with all the signs to create this singular story that is found in the natal chart. And then the story tells you, you know, all your expressions. It's like, In the field of science, when human beings learned how to uh, transcribe the entire human genetic uh, material, okay, that's it's literally like the same thing. From that genetic material, you have certain predispositions, okay, and that science is developing, you know, very rapidly. But natal chart synthesis is the same type of thing, but for personality, because. Your genomic sequence is the biological representation of that personality. But scientists still don't know how to go from reading base nucleotides in a DNA sequence to personality because of all the interactions with the environment. Okay? But natal chart synthesis, when it's sophisticated enough, can delineate the spectrum of that personality, which can now feedback into the genetic sequence because the reality of the fact is that it is your perception of everything that ultimately gets transcribed into those genetic base nucleotides i mean not all your experiences the parts of your experiences that are so important and they are stable they mean something those are the ones that get transcribed into actual uh, base nucleotide arrangements in your dna Okay, it's all memory. Whichever way you look at it, it's all memory. Even your natal chart synthesis is still a memory. They're all encoding systems. Okay, that's really what it is. Astrology is just a different language. So if you haven't got your natal chart synthesis, come and order yours now. Do it now. Because if you think ordering one is expensive, well, how much has ignorance cost already? How much more are you willing for it to cost? I'm not saying that you won't make mistakes anymore once you have your natal chart synthesis. You will only make the mistakes that help you to grow. You will not make the really foolish ones. And you see, part of the most foolish decisions that we make as people are especially the ones concerning our value system. We just choose wrong. And it's so wrong that often we look back and say, wow, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I chose that. Because there seems to be no value from it. No learning point really. Just messy pain. Now, Sagittarius is something quite different from the Venusian instinct. It really is. Because it's what I call a post-orgasmic experience. That's really what it is. Because Scorpio itself, which is the sign before Sagittarius is the orgasmic experience and it is Sagittarius that comes out of Scorpio okay so the post-orgasmic experience and the orgasmic experience they have this relationship between them because you can think of it as the orgasmic experience is pre-sex the post-orgasmic experience is post-sex 
so that before the Sagittarian archetype can really make any sense, right, you must be in a post-orgasmic relationship. That is, a relationship where you have been able to achieve the orgasmic experience of Scorpio. And it must be such that that experience is now stable in your reality. Otherwise, the Sagittarian experience really won't make sense to you. Okay, if you're still having waviness or a lot of dysfunction where you have Scorpio in terms of all the placements there and all the archetypes, then the Sagittarian experience will elude you. When you consider what the Sagittarian experience is, wow, that's a big price to pay. Because ultimately, most people just perceive the Sagittarian experience as what? Luck, optimism, faith and all that. But what does it really mean? And in this podcast, we're going to explain where all of those things come from. It's not going to sound very strange because if you've been listening to my podcasts, you will uh, immediately understand what I'm talking about. That the Sagittarian experience is the development of an expanding field of consciousness. But it's very different from the Scorpio archetype because Scorpio wants to bring things to a crunch. It wants to integrate things to a singularity. That's to bring different things together and crush them into a singularity. A singularity is this... You know, it's a mathematical point because it's the smallest possible whatever that can be. And so just like the the singularity that sits at the center of a black hole, it's a mathematical point. So that Scorpio is that integration between two or that merger between two things that wants to merge them completely into one indistinguishable identity. But something happens post that. It doesn't just stay like that. Once it merges into that singularity, it explodes. It explodes outward. So that instead of two things now, you now have only one source for that explosion. That exploding outwardness that is expanding in all directions, that is the Sagittarian archetype. And its root lies in that orgasmic experience. That is why for you to truly enjoy or to truly experience what the Sagittarian archetype is, you must be in that type of relationship with another human being. A relationship where it is genuine and honest And so the orgasmic experience is very pure. All right. And that's what leads to the purity of the Sagittarian experience. And it must be frequent because the Sagittarian experience requires a type of pumping activity because the space must continue to expand because the space that's really expanding is the space in your head. And that space is being populated by what? very specific types of knowledge understanding and in that space you are linking so many concepts together very high level concepts and they're not just being linked randomly like you would have in the case of gemini they're linked with a very specific purpose there is a promise at the end that you are striving for and so the sagittarian experience is one that allows you to build a concrete reality So that when you are chasing a focus when you are pursuing a project a big project life-changing project it's a goal it's a long-term goal it's probably going to take you years and in that journey you have to persevere because you're going to encounter so many trials and tribulations that will test your ability to persevere and what is going to get you through that experience is the post-orgasmic experience of Sagittarius that's really what it is And if you're lucky enough to find or to have that relationship that allows you to generate this Sagittarian experience, then you will grow. And you will grow and grow and grow until you are able to put the finishing touches to your masterpiece. That masterpiece is Capricorn. Do you understand the connection now? So altogether, Venus in Sagittarius is a very pleasing experience because the Venus comes from this post-orgasmic experience itself. And so every time you finish the orgasmic experience and you are released into that expanding space of awareness, there is a delight and a pleasure that comes from it. So Venus in Sagittarius is the kind of natal aspect that values the intimacy of that partnership and the expansiveness that comes from it. And usually the physical form of this expansiveness, apart from the orgasmic experience itself, is that these people love to get around. They love to grow. They love to jump from one place to another. They're usually engaged in some type of journey, either figuratively or literally. So that they're always traveling. The idea of moving to different lands and cultures and spending time there is very appealing to them. But I want you to understand where that is coming from. 
Because normally if you're experiencing this as an actual post-orgasmic experience with a loving partner, then the need to actually jump to different locations may not be there. Because the jump is what is required. It is the exploration of a space. Now, whether you're exploring that space upstairs in your head or you need to enact the exploration of that space as a physical reality depends on the aspects to that Venus. That's really what it is. Most people, you see, these are things that you will never really hear anywhere else. To understand how physical reality is generated, once an internal impulse that is natural becomes blocked and you cannot express it internally. And because of that blockage, you externalize it because it's the same search. Now, your soul doesn't care whether it's physical reality or it's internal. So it doesn't know the difference between the two. And that's why people do some of the things that they do. All right. They're pushed into that because they cannot find the resolution internally. And so you externalize it as a reality and you feel the need to go from one foreign culture to another. Exploring, analyzing. But all the while, your mind is expanding because the expansion becomes prerequisite. Now, whether you're achieving it through uh, the orgasmic contact or you're traveling from country to country, your soul doesn't care. But there's something else that is, it's not just about flitting from one place to another, exploring different things and ready to, you know, get to know what's happening everywhere. It's not about that. You see, because the Venus in Sagittarius placement really is concerned about this sense of beauty and harmony so that there must be meaning to your moving around, to your exploration. The pattern that you form as you move through that exploration space, it must be pleasing to you. It must have meaning, meaning that the goal must be so worthy and lofty that it literally generates within you the physical sensation of pleasure. Traveling to see a loved one. Pleasure. Tasting different foods from different cultures as a way of enriching your own ex internal experience. Pleasure. Enjoying and exploring a wide variety of music because each musical sensation, each change brings for you an, a good amount of pleasure. But that's not where it stops. You see, because the Sagittarian experience is not just concerned with just expanding spaces and exploration. Because of Venus, it has to be pleasurable, organized, beautiful in terms of symmetry, right? So it translates into the need for a discourse. You must be learning something really tangible there. So usually Venus in Sagittarius people, they pursue higher level degrees. You're drawn to that higher philosophy of mind because you get a certain sense of pleasure from exploring those areas and connecting meaning in those spaces. This is something that's very important. It is also not unusual for Venus in Sagittarius to be drawn to foreigners as potential love partners. There's just something quite unique about being able to engage within a space that is, for you, represents an expansion because you don't know anything about that space. There's an allure to it. Okay? Now, when Venus finds itself in Sagittarius, it means that when you look at the patterns of evolution that are formed as this space is expanding and the centaur, which is the archer, is moving through this space. When you look at this space from a high-level pattern, you see something that is quite remarkable. It means that the person is evolving according to a particular type of rhythm. It's not random. The individual is following a pattern to their life. And any time their life begins to have this type of pattern or shape, they begin to experience a much deeper faith in life. They begin to feel like life is guiding them and that they are on a mission. But when life begins to become crazy and haphazard and things lose their, their, their rhythm, their natural rhythm, events seem out of place and events are always happening in such a way that it leaves them in situations where they can't cope, then something has gone wrong. And usually the source for that, whether you want to you know, believe it or not, is in the orgasmic experience. That's where it's coming from. You're sleeping with the wrong person. And so what Venus in Sagittarius is telling you is that in your life, as you grow and as you evolve in your life, there will be 
patterns of behavior that allow things to appear just when you need them. And that the appearance of those things will seem as if being coordinated by a higher power. Such that the individual begins to intuit from the internal consciousness that their life has a grand meaning. That their life is working towards something. Now, don't underestimate this feeling. It's very powerful because it allows the individual to persevere. And so, Venus in Sagittarius is one type of compensator in the natal chart. That's really what it is. So, depending on where Taurus and Libra sit in your natal chart, that's where the compensation is likely to appear. And this compensation, you know, when things grow, they change in space and time. It's talking about the nature of events. For instance, if you have Venus in Sagittarius and everything is working correctly, when you extend yourself based on a gut instinct, based on something that you just, you just have a perception that this is going to turn out right. And then it turns out right. And then you call it luck. And people call it luck. But the reality of the matter is that it is down to an internal sensing mechanism. Something that can sense the rhythm, the ebb and the flow of reality. It's Venus in the Sagittarian space. And so that space now becomes the nature of faith. And Venus can now be found in that faith, as that faith. And when it comes true like that, then life takes on a beautiful feeling. Now, you hear what they say that luck runs out from time to time, but the type of luck that is connected to Sagittarius is not really random chance like the roll of a die. It's not. It's actually something that is generated. And the Venus in Sagittarius personality needs this because their life is going to need that so that they will find themselves confronting the type of challenges that require the establishment of this faith. They will be asked to persevere. They may go through very difficult periods in life, whereby they will have to tap into an understanding that is much higher than themselves, so that all their previous experiences of being guided now allows them to weather this challenge, because they know that it's part of their overall life pattern, and that is what is unfolding. When things begin to go wrong, these patterns don't match anymore. They're out of sync. So that when you need something that would naturally appear because you have somehow worked for it, it doesn't appear. Something is blocking it. And so the individual begins to externalize the reality, the Venusian instinct in Sagittarius. He begins to externalize it, to search for it. And that comes out in the form of searching for what? A mate, a partner. And when that begins to happen, the Venus in Sagittarius personality begins to flit from one partner to another, such that the potential for partnership now represents the, the space that is expanding itself. But that's not what it's supposed to be. The space that is expanding is not supposed to be different individuals. It's supposed to be a discourse within the mind. And that discourse contains knowledge of how to build practical achievement in reality. That is, how to solve practical problems. Because that is what the orgasmic experience does to the mind. Do you know how much mental and emotional energy people spend or people expend because of bad sex? Do you have any idea? It's simple. I mean, an adult who is unfulfilled because... What Scorpio needs is fulfillment. That desire to unite with someone at such a fundamental level, it consumes a lot of energy once it's unfulfilled. And when it's fulfilled, the individual is released into an expanding space. Those are the people you find that type of connection with. Those are the people that you normally fall in love with. Now, if the love is reciprocated, which it has to be for all of this to work, you can't force it. It's the natural continuation of something that already exists in nature. So you're not really creating anything. You're simply going with the flow that nature already goes with. You're tapping into all of that. 
And out of that comes a wave that is expanding. That is the Sagittarian experience. And when you are riding that wave, the way that your life is orchestrated, need meets requirement. That's how it goes. And the process is such that because it is an expanding space, as you get more exposed to need meeting requirement, you are building something that is tangible. And it's not going to be an easy process in terms of time. It's not going to happen over the short period of time. It's going to happen over a long period of time and you will be tested. To be Sagittarius is to be tested before the final delivery of the promise. You must be tested. And what is being tested is the belief that you have in the mechanism or the processes that have gotten you so far. You are being called on to understand that luck is not the random toss of a die. You are being called into a higher awareness. Now, when the process is complete, what you become is a master. A master is someone who can describe what has happened and how so that other people can reproduce it. That's a master. And that is the eventual station of Venus in Sagittarius. Now, to recap, since the Venusian placement in Sagittarius really is correlated with an expanding space, it is very important that you pair up with people who understand this, that you are with someone who actually understands this process and what is happening. Because at the end of the day, you are going to grow. And the growth itself is not random. It's not purposeless. It's actually working towards something. You must have a grand plan. You must have a grand mission. And you must be involved in that mission with your partner. Because what ultimately becomes Capricorn, it starts way deeper in Scorpio. In fact, it is the Scorpio that tells you exactly how that Capricorn is going to turn out. And the barometer for measuring exactly how effective this process is going to be is truth. How honest you are with each other. That's it. Now, if you're a Venus in Sagittarius and you don't have a partner and you don't have that type of partner, then it's very difficult to actually get the benefits of Venus in Sagittarius. You're going to have to somehow replicate the effect of Scorpio in your life. So you look to where you have Scorpio in your natal chart. You're going to have to do some work there. And the fact that you don't have another human being with which to become that intimate with doesn't mean that you cannot become intimate with another aspect of your reality. The most important thing about intimacy is truth and the expression of vulnerability, the safety that comes from that expression, because that is the basis upon which trust is built. And once that trust is established, doesn't matter what with, really. Once that trust is established, then there is a release that release now becomes a Sagittarian experience. So that your Scorpio really is anything that you are absolutely genuine with and you pour your heart and soul into it so that you can experience that depth of intimacy. From there will grow the Sagittarian experience and then you can tap into what the promise of that Venus and Sagittarius really is. And you know that Scorpios love mysteries more than anything else. They're searching for truth, so they dig. And they dig until they begin to come closer and closer to the truth. Now, you say the truth, right? As if it's some type of objective truth lying out there. But the reality of the matter is that you can only experience truth as you. So that the truth that you're searching for really is the truth about your own existence. And the closer you come to that understanding, the deeper you can feel in connection with this truth. And from there comes the Sagittarian experience. Because All the Sagittarian experience really wants is that there is an intrinsic faith in human life. That we're not just random creatures that suddenly appeared here in a meaningless type of existence. No, that is antithetical to what Sagittarius really implies. Sagittarius is the launch of faith. But it's not faith that just, you know, baseless faith. That's not faith. That's lunacy. Faith requires knowledge because it is knowledge. It is the application of knowledge over and over again that makes you a master. If there's no knowledge, what exactly are you going to master at the end of the day? You see the difference? And some people think that uh, the Sagittarian experience correlates with religion. No, it correlates with the need to believe in something. But how you believe in something is a measure of the quality of that Sagittarian experience that you will have. 
If you believe in things that are not founded on knowledge or on a lack of understanding, then you will not experience the quality of that Sagittarian experience. What you will experience is disappointment.